This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar, Impacts of Clean Power Plan Compliance Choices for the Southeastern United States, Economic Modeling Results. I'm Jeremy Tarr, Policy Counsel and the Climate and Energy Program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Presenting today is Dr. Martin Ross. He's a senior research economist here and the architect of our DM electricity uh, dispatch model. The Nicholas Institute is a research institute located on the campus of Duke University. We provide economic, legal, and policy analysis to decision makers at both state and federal levels on a range of environmental issues. We span the academic and policy worlds by drawing upon analysis from in-house experts as well as the broader resources across the university in order to provide timely and objective information to decision makers. Before we get started, I just want to emphasize that the Nicholas Institute does not advocate for policy outcomes, so the analysis presented here is not an endorsement of the Clean Power Plan generally or any particular compliance strategy. Um, our purpose, rather, is to make modeling results available to states and stakeholders for reference as they're evaluating options for responding to the Clean Power Plan. You can learn more about our Clean Power Plan analysis by visiting our website at nicholasinstitute.duke.edu. Once there, click uh, on the Climate and Energy Program and then click Special Projects. You'll see a page on our Clean Air Act and Clean Power Plan work. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. The, pre the presentation is about 45 minutes. We'll then have 20 to 30 minutes available for questions. Uh, during the presentation, you can anonymously ask clarifying questions by using the chat function. Uh, during the question and answer period following the presentation, um, use the raise your hand button or uh, you can continue to use the chat function which will remain available to you. Wanted to remind everyone that the webinar is open to the public. We do have media on the line. We also will make the slides and a video of the webinar available online to you in the coming days. We have about 130 attendees, so want to thank everyone for taking the time to join the webinar. Next, I want to introduce um, Martin. Dr. Ross is a research, uh, senior research economist at the Nicholas Institute, and he built the DM model that we're using to model clean power plant impacts. Before coming to the Institute, Martin worked at RTI International, where he developed economic and electricity models including the adage model, which is used by the U.S. EPA and others to respond to congressional requests for legislative analysis. Prior to joining RTI, Martin spent several years at Charles River Associates, where he handled their U.S. macroeconomic modeling and worked closely with industry groups such as EPRI and Edison Electric Institute. He also worked at EPA's policy office in the late 90s, looking at global climate policies and possible implica implications at that time uh, of the Kyoto Protocol for the United States. So we're very fortunate to have Martin as a part of our Clean Power Plan team. Martin, thanks for agreeing to present today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, let me start with a quick summary of uh, you know, what we're going to do today. Um, you know, I'd first like to start with uh, you know, briefly going through the Clean Power Plan. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but I want to sort of you know, take a look at some of the particular points that are going to affect you know, the assumptions that we make in the modeling and how those might affect the model results. So sort of briefly summarize that, uh, then go through the, uh, the modeling scenarios. We're going to take a look at describe the uh, DM model a bit, and then uh, jump into uh, the results and try to get through as much as we can, and if possible, come to the sensitivity analysis on some of the assumptions at the end. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, you know, that the Clean Power Plan uh, basically is, you know, saying that each state must uh, meet an emissions rate goal in terms of uh, pounds per megawatt hour. And uh, EPA has provided a, you know, fairly wide range of, uh, flexibility mechanism, mechanisms that states can use to, uh, to meet these goals. Um, you know, states can go it alone or they can uh, choose to uh, join into regional or presumably a national trading groups. 
Uh, the policy also lets you bring in, you know, outside defense options in terms of renewables and energy efficiency and sort of factor that into your emissions rate calculation. And it is also possible to uh, convert to a, uh, a mass basis if that is, uh, you know, perceived as uh, more preferable for the states. So, uh, you know, the, these emissions rate goals were calculated sort of using four building blocks uh, in EPA's analysis, all of which are options in, in the modeling that we have done, so I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, but they are, you know, the heat rate improvements for the uh, existing coal plants, uh, the possibility of redispatching from coal to the existing natural gas plants, uh, you know, bringing in the renewables and the, uh, you know, at risk and under construction nuclear, and uh, finally energy efficiency. So I wanted to uh, quickly take a look at sort of what's going on in the southeast historically for those of you that aren't as, as familiar with this part of the uh, country. Um, so we are uh, covering the nine states that are shown on this graph as part of our, what we're calling the southeast region, and this is a uh, taking a look at their historical emissions rates in terms of uh, pounds per megawatt hour as, you know, based on the data that, uh, you know, is in the historical data used in the model as of 2012, uh, which is uh, the year that uh, was used to, uh, you know, calculate the emissions goals for the states. Um, so we've got this uh, graph shows, um, the you know the emissions rates and sort of ranges for the uh, the coal units and the existing natural gas combined cycle units in the model. So like the the box is the uh, median uh, emissions rate for the coal units in the model, and the the yellow diamond is the uh, median emissions rate for the gas combined cycle units in the model. The sort of shaded boxes around those are the uh, you know, 25 and 75 percentile, uh, you know, points around that median. And then the sort of lines show the, uh, you know, extreme ends of the emissions rates, you know, for the units in the model. I wouldn't pay you know, as much attention to the extremes since they tend to be, you know, sort of the smaller uh, plants that uh, aren't going to affect the analysis, you know, in uh, dramatic ways. So those are the emissions rates. You can see that generally, you know, the coal units are around 2,000, 2,100 pounds per megawatt hour uh, versus the existing gas units at uh, maybe 900 pounds per megawatt hour. And you can compare that to the uh, interim and final goals for the uh, states in this region. So you, you can see uh, some states um, have goals that are, you know, sort of equal to or below uh, the existing gas combined cycle, uh, Kentucky, without uh, natural gas units in the historical data, has uh, an emissions target that is uh, closer to 1,800 pounds, so that is uh, above uh, what would be uh, gas units, uh, but below all of their uh, coal units, in effect. So. What we have taken a look at is, you know, largely focused on what EPA was calling their option one in the regulatory impact analysis, their illustrative analysis that they conducted using their version of the IPM model. Uh, so that option one was looking at, uh, you know, an interim uh, target for the emissions rates that applied through the uh, first decade of the policy, 2020 through 2029 and uh, you were allowed to sort of smooth the adjustments over that decade. And then there was a final target in 2030 and uh, going forward that is binding in this modeling in each uh, five-year time period after uh, 2030, uh, similar to what, uh, what was done in their illustrative, illustrative analysis. Uh, so we have looked at, uh, you know, sort of focusing on, for this, fairly brief presentation, two main sets of scenarios, uh, starting with uh, the basic uh, emissions rate trading approach. And we have looked at, uh, you know, that from either, you know, a regional trading perspective where states can trade uh, within, you know, within their region to try to uh, take advantage of the most cost-effective options across the region that they're located in or they can choose to uh, do sort of a state trading in which uh, each state within the region would uh, go it alone 
Um, so under that go it alone approach, you know, each state would still sort of be, you know, smoothing stuff, trading within the state boundaries, but that trading would not extend as far as this policy goes outside of the state. Now, so obviously, they're trading electricity, you know, normally through the electricity grid that would, uh, you know, cover potentially multiple states. Uh, but for uh, trading of the uh, sort of credits, allowances, however you like to think of it, specific to the clean power plan, that would uh, be either within the broad region or within each state, depending on which we're looking at. So that emissions rate approach is then contrasted to, uh, you know, a conversion of that goal to uh, the mass-based mass, uh, mass -based, uh, trading for the existing fossil units. And uh, for that, I was using, uh, you know, EPA's estimates of those, you know, one possible way of converting the rate into a mass target that came out uh, last November using those numbers. And then we're looking at that under a uh, regional versus, uh, again, each state goes it alone approach. Uh, time permitting, we'll get into uh, some sensitivities that we've done around these cases, uh, starting with, uh, you know, you know the, the renewable costs and energy efficiency uh, availability are certainly, you know, fairly big drivers in the, the modeling results, so definitely want to take a look at some of those. Uh, then, uh, time permitting, take a look at what would happen if you included a new natural gas combined cycle under the uh, trading system using either a rate approach or a mass-based approach. And then uh, finally, you might take a quick look at uh, what happens uh, if you make different assumptions about natural gas prices, whether they're sort of higher or lower than, you know, the, uh, the starting point uh, for the model. Uh, quickly, uh, go through a couple of highlights of uh, the findings, uh, just as a primer. Um, so, just generally ranking those policy options that I discussed from lowest cost to uh, highest cost for the southeast. Um, you know, the results of the modeling are sort of showing that uh, a mass-based approach with regional trading is going to be the lowest cost option, followed by mass-based trading where, you know, each state went to, went alone uh, trading within the state but not trading with the neighbors in terms of these uh, credits. And that is followed up by, uh, you know, a regional uh, rate-based, uh, emissions rate-based approach, and finally uh, a rate-based approach in which each state uh, sort of went it alone. And I sort of highlighted the fact that this is, uh, you know, that particular ranking is somewhat specific to the southeast. Um, you do get somewhat different answers in different parts of the country, and you might also potentially get different answers for the southeast, depending on, you know, some of the sensitivities you were taking a look at. But for the main case, that is, you know, sort of where we're at. Uh, a couple of uh, summary points in terms of what's happening with generation before we get into things. Uh, under an emissions rate approach, where the new states, again, are meeting those rate targets, uh, you do see initially a large drop in uh, coal generation, although that tends to uh, you know come back a bit over time. Under a mass approach, uh, the um, converting the targets to a mass approach does tend to help uh, maintain the existing coal generation and the generation from the existing gas combined cycle, or oh, I'm sorry, from a new gas combined cycle, but. But it's uh, not uh, not as beneficial for the existing gas units. Uh, and I should say that uh, the clean power plan is not significantly increasing uh, renewable electricity penetration in the southeast, unless the uh, costs for that uh, renewable generation are sort of lower than the uh, Energy Information Administration's annual energy outlook forecasts that are sort of the starting point for the modeling. And we'll come back to that a bit, hopefully. Um, on, in terms of the cost results from the modeling, uh, quick summary, uh, under the emissions rate trading, if the states are going it alone, the policy costs are, you know, sort of roughly 30 percent higher over the first uh, decade or two of the policy versus if they are coordinating within the southeast region. So, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly a cost, or I should say sort of a, 
a fairly significant benefit for uh, coordinate, coordinating across the region that really lets you take advantage of some cost-effective reductions that might exist within you know, neighboring states that aren't available in each of the individual states. Uh, the costs on a, of a mass-based approach um, compared with this uh, rate-based approach, the cost of, the, of converting to a mass cap are, you know, anywhere between 15 to 35 percent lower than the cost under a regional rate-based trading scheme, again, over the first sort of decade or two uh, that we'll sort of focus on for the cost results. So let me quickly describe the model, um, uh, the DM model. So there is a macroeconomic component um, to the model, but we're not really sort of applying that here for a variety of reasons. Uh, the, the energy efficiency, how you sort of interact those energy efficiency assumptions with uh, the electricity dispatch model is, is a bit complicated, so we haven't gone down that road yet, and it makes it a little harder to compare the results to uh, some of the other analyses that you might see out there. So um, what we're really going to focus on is the electricity dispatch component of the model, and that is what I would think of as a fairly standard framework for, you know, it's a linear, linear programming model that is trying to minimize the cost of electricity generation subject to meeting electricity demand and all the policy constraints, you know, related to the clean power plan and all the you know, baseline, you know, state RPS policies and, you know, the mercury air toxics rule. So it's, it's sort of meeting all those. The model, is, it is a national model with a bunch of regional markets. Uh, so it's solving for the entire nation. Um, we're, and, you know, at the moment we're sort of running with uh, 40 regional markets within the continental U.S. Uh, and, you know, the model is based on sort of a wide variety of historical and uh, forecast data from uh, the IPM needs uh, database, uh, NREL for some of the renewable data, and then a lot of forecasts from the annual energy outlook. And the model is a uh, foresight model, so it's anticipating future policies and anticipating future gas prices and sort of planning ahead in order to minimize the costs of uh, you know, meeting uh, the various policies that are coming into the model. I uh, quickly highlight some of the assumptions that are sort of particularly driving the uh, the results. Uh, we're using the annual energy outlook 2014 with its gas prices, electricity demands, all that sort of stuff as a uh, starting point for the analysis. The model does have sort of, you know, like a natural gas supply curve and a coal supply curve within it. So uh, if uh, gas demand goes up, you know, as a result of a policy, uh, you know, the gas prices will go up in response to that increase in demand, but the AEO 2014 is sort of the starting point. Uh, the model sees that uh, the clean power plant starts in 2020 and, uh, you know, reaches its sort of final emissions goal rate in 2030, and it's going to start planning uh, right away to uh, minimize the cost, including, uh, you know, deciding on new construction. So it's, uh, you know, perhaps uh, reacting a bit more quickly than people would in the real world, and I'll sort of point out where that might be affecting the results as we go through some of the uh, the data. Uh, just uh, briefly mention that uh, I had not included uh, biomass coal fire as a renewable option uh, for the coal plants in the southeast. In part, we are sort of uh, waiting to see what, you know, the, you know, assumed emissions rate number would, would be for biomass uh, uh, coming out of, uh, you know, some of the EPA stuff in December, but uh, without, you know, an actual number to put on what that biomass should count for in terms of emissions, we uh, decided to leave the biomass emissions co-firing out, and we just haven't included the gas co-firing because that wasn't something we were hearing was going to be a likely cost-effective possibility in the southeast, but it is something that we could uh, certainly revisit in the future. And uh, just briefly, uh, it's not going to affect things too much for these results that I'm going to focus on over the first uh, decade of the policy, but longer term, uh, the model is just sort of following uh, the, the NEMS model, assuming that uh, nuclear plants are getting a second 20-year life extension, which has certainly implications for U.S. natural gas use 
going forward in the model. Um, so very briefly wanted to say what you might or might not want to expect from this type of modeling. Um, so, you know, just keep in mind that you know, what they're doing is minimizing the cost of supplying electricity to the entire national grid over the forecast period of the model. So it's not really, you know, trying to minimize costs to the southeast per se, it's really minimizing costs to the, the national grid as a whole. And I, I would really think of these models as uh, most useful for sort of comparing one policy to another and, and you know, analyzing what the important sensitivities are to uh, meeting these, uh, uh, you know, different goals. Uh, what they're not doing is then, uh, you know, sort of worrying about stranded assets or sort of assets in place or, you know, money that has been, been borrowed in the past to uh, build these plants or keep these plants running. And uh, we're also sort of focusing on the wholesale electricity markets and really not going into, uh, you know, retail pricing and uh, the consumer side of things. So in the modeling, so what we are, first of all, not doing is we're not forcing any of those four building blocks into the model uh, that were used to uh, come up with the emissions rate goals. They're all choices in the model. Uh, first of which was those uh, coal unit efficiency retrofits. Um, so the EPA analysis had, had, analysis had assumed that uh, all coal plants could uh, get uh, a 6% improvement at $100 per megawatt, or $100 per kilowatt, sorry. Uh, we have taken a look at some of the Sergeant Lundy data that's out there and uh, you know, made sort of some assumptions around that starting point and uh, tried to you know, guess you know, which units have uh, you know, already made some of those efficiency uh, improvements and may not have them available to the future and sort of the outcome of that process is uh, we're looking at more of an average of uh, two or three percent efficiency improvement available at a lower cost. And the model is allowed to choose to do those retrofits in the baseline, and you do get some of those retrofits coming in just on a cost basis in the baseline, regardless of any clean power plan policy. Uh, redispatching building block number two is a choice in the model. The model can choose it based on cost, but it's not forced to uh, redispatch sort of up to, you know, 70, some sort of 70% utilization factor for uh, for the existing natural gas combined cycle units. Martin, what, what are the low and high gas costs uh, that the model's operating under? Oh, geez. Uh, low and high for the sensitivity case? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be uh, uh, the DAEO side cases from last year that uh, um, looked at uh, low and high resource availability for coal, or I'm sorry, for uh, natural gas and oil. So basically it's uh, up and down about 25, 30% on the uh, gas prices from the, the main forecast case. So uh, a decent, you know, either increment up or down for the gas prices. Uh, so um, renewables can be constructed uh, in the model uh, based on their cost effectiveness. Uh, they're not, uh, uh, you know, the, you do have the state RPS targets that are mandating particular levels of renewables in the baseline. Uh, then the states can choose to build more renewables if that is the most cost-effective way of meeting the clean power plan goals. I am not at the moment counting uh, new nuclear towards uh, meeting the emissions goal rates. So we're sort of, uh, you know, perhaps waiting for some clarification in the. Uh, you know, the final rule on uh, exactly how nuclear is going to be counted. So the, the sort of at-risk and under-construction nuclear is counted according to how EPA factored that, that into the emissions rate goals, but we're not uh, adding in sort of extra nuclear to uh, count towards the goals. Um, energy efficiency in the model can be selected if it is sort of a cost-effective choice. We are using the costs and uh, the quantities that are available from uh, EPA's technical support document at the moment. Now we are looking at uh, sort of developing more detailed energy efficiency supply curves for the model, but uh, these particular results are using sort of the price and quantity from the EPA illustrative analysis. 
Um, uh, with somewhat different from uh, the EPA modeling, we are allowing those energy efficiency measures to enter in the baseline if they are cost effective. In one of, we sort of have two baselines. They can enter in the baseline in one of those two baselines if they're cost effective. And generally they are proving to be cost effective assuming you have a utility cost sharing arrangement where the utilities are picking up 50% of those costs and then the, the participants are picking up the other 50% of the energy efficiency cost. Uh, the regions we're doing basically follow uh, the six regions that were used in the EPA's analysis. Uh, I have sort of highlighted the southeast region there, and it is a bit different in that we have rolled Virginia into what we are calling the southeast region. Other than that, the other five regions uh, you know, are following uh, what was in the EPA write-up. One thing that uh, is different than some of the, potentially the other modelers out there, I have assumed um, under the regional trading that each state is keeping its emissions rate goal. So, um, you know, if Kentucky has uh, got a goal around 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour and it chooses to trade with uh, South Carolina at around 800 pounds per megawatt hour, uh, those two states would not be sort of averaging their goals. They Each state keeps their goal but still can then benefit from uh, trading with each other if it's cost effective to do so. Uh, but that does tend to uh, change where you're going to see the generation occurring. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So uh, important policy considerations to keep in mind when you're looking at these results. Uh, for the emissions rate trading stuff, um, what that's really doing is in effect, assuming that uh, units that are below the emissions rate goal for each state are being subsidized by being able to sell credits or allowances for each hour that they generate and they are selling those allowances to the units either in the state or the region that are above the emissions rate goal. And those, you know, since those units that are above the goal have to buy those uh, allowances, they are in effect being, uh, you know, taxed in some way. Uh, normally when you do this emissions rate trading, it is assumed that those interactions are occurring within the industry and, uh, you know, the states are not, uh, you know, selling, engaged in some buying or selling of those allowances. Under a uh, when you convert things to the mass-based approach, um, in effect all units are being taxed in proportion to their emissions through needing to purchase allowances. You know, or, you know, they could be grandfathered to the particular units, but you know, any unit, any existing fossil unit is going to need to uh, turn over allowances for each uh, ton of emissions that it uh, produces. Um, and then there's the whole issue of, who, you know, who owns those allowances. Um, the state could retain ownership, they could grandfather them, and uh, how you go about that would uh, feed through into the retail rates, but we're really sort of focusing on the wholesale side of things here. Uh, and one thing to note is, you know, I would normally think of a mass-based approach as potentially adding some flexibility to the system, so that can lead to lower costs. And, uh, you know, anytime you've got lower costs, you're going to potentially see coal units are going to be cheaper to operate and uh, run more, which might not be in line with, uh, you know, some, you know, sort of intuition on, you know, coal units under a mass uh, cap. So I'm going to sort of mainly focus on generation since that, you know, rolls in a whole lot of factors in terms of, uh, retirements and capacity utilization and uh, generation is sort of, you know, the quickest, easiest way to cover hopefully a lot of information quickly. So this is uh, looking at generation in the southeast and uh, a lot of what I'm going to look at for generation are sort of the regional regional approaches, whether they're rate-based or mass-based, um, just because, you know, regional versus state is sort of most important for the cost side of things, but you know, somewhat less important for, you know, total regional generation. So what we got here is a graph with uh, billions of kilowatt hours up the, the vertical axis and then uh, sort of the four types of units on the horizontal axis that are sort of most affected by the policy, which would be the existing coal units, the existing 
natural gas combined cycle units, new natural gas combined cycle units, and then renewables. So I'm going to take a look at uh, sort of the baseline uh, for the model and then the, the emissions rate trade rate-based trading results for the policy. So this, starting with the COE units, uh, the semi-black bars are the uh, baseline coal generation in 2020 and 2030 for the uh, coal units. And that, um, you know, so you can sort of see the contrast between the baseline and what happens to coal generation under uh, the emissions uh, rate trading approach. And you can see that there's a fairly significant drop in uh, coal generation from the existing units, and that happens you know, quite quickly by 2020 under an emissions rate trading scheme. So that, you know, that's a pretty big drop in generation. It's got to come from somewhere to, you know, keep your demand going. And I should point out, you know, the energy efficiency numbers are also factoring into that uh, electricity demand in these numbers. But you still got to make up those, you know, you could still got to make up that drop in coal generation somewhere. So in part, that is coming from uh, the existing natural gas units. Uh, if you compare the baseline with the, the blue uh, rate policy uh, bars there, you can see where generation from the existing gas units has gone up somewhat. So this, this policy has sort of shifted you from coal into gas, kind of like the building block two that was looking at that potential redispatch from coal to the existing gas units. You do see some of that going on there, but it's not it's not a you know, like huge amount of redispatch because that is the model is not thinking that is like you know the most cost effective option for meeting these goals. Um, so uh, what you have done here in some sense is you put a policy over part of the industry. You put a policy over the existing units, uh, the existing coal and the existing gas units, and what that is going to do is you know raise the cost of those units and potentially drive you into uh, building new gas combined cycle units in the southeast. You know, in the baseline, you were going to do some of that anyway, um, but, uh, you know, as a result of the policy, you're doing it more quickly, and you're sort of bringing that construction forward in time also. And you can see there where uh, that construction is entering by 2020 in the model. I'm not sort of constrained at the moment how quickly that generation can come in on a regional or state basis. There's constraints nationally, but uh, they're not, you know, particularly affecting the southeast. So that construction is occurring fairly quickly. And, uh, um, you know, it's, and that is, you know, helping to sort of offset the uh, decline in the generation from the existing coal units. Uh, renewables in the southeast, you know, you know, baseline policy case, uh, we're just not seeing a big incentive as, uh, you know, the current, you know, sort of assumed uh, renewables costs in the model, and we'll come back to that. Um, so those renewable costs, I should say, are coming, you know, the starting point for those renewable costs are out of the annual energy outlook forecasts, and, you know, some people would tend to view those as potentially conservative costs. So they start with those numbers and then they are improving along, you know, some assumptions out of the EPRI modeling, which are, you know, perhaps a bit more optimistic than, uh, you know, some of the number, numbers you might see in the IPM model as used in the EPA analysis. Uh, we'll come back to that though. So uh, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with how the state goals are calculated, but I just wanted to remind you because now I'm going to quickly try to get through a couple of sensitivities on altering some of the assumptions that affect how this goal are going to affect how the model is responding. So the emissions rate target for each state is basically, you know, CO2 emissions from the affected units divided by uh, generation from the affected units plus generation from the renewables and generation from uh, energy efficiency. So what I'm going to do next is take a look at, uh, you know, what happens, uh, how sensitive are these results to, you know, altering some of the basic assumptions in the model. So this is the same sort of uh, generation graph to the southeast for an emissions rate approach, but what I'm taking a look at now is, uh, so these were the emissions rate 
uh, results for generation for the different types of units under uh, the main set of assumptions in the model. And uh, now we're going to take a look at what happens if those renewable uh, electricity costs were, you know, too conservative. So I'm, you know, we're, I'm dropping the renewable construction costs by 33% today, you know, sort of right away, and then they also improve more quickly over time. And where, what does that do to the uh, renewable penetration in the southeast? And the reason I'm doing this is uh, because uh, the data in the model, you know, we're using data from uh, basically NREL, which has, uh, you know, state level data for wind availability and, uh, you know, solar, you know, effectiveness and wind effectiveness in the southeast. And the southeast uh, does not have a whole lot of uh, wind available um, in that data. So, and, uh, you know, we want to take a look at how sensitive those results are to the cost as well. So, what we've got here, so, you know, we've lowered the cost of renewables here, and you can see, if you look at the right-hand side of the graph, that the renewable generation in, by 2030 at least, has gone up fairly significantly in the model. So, it's gone from, I don't even know, what, you know, 10 billion kilowatt hours up to, you know, closer to 100 billion kilowatt hours um, by 2030. So that that is going to make uh, the, the, you know, these emissions rate targets easier to meet because, you know, that generation sort of factors into that calculation of those rate targets. So, you know, that is going to, that extra renewable generation is going to allow the existing coal units over on the left-hand side of the graph to generate more and uh, potentially also allow the uh, the existing uh, natural gas units to generate more, although that's that's you know a bit less of a given. So basically, what you are seeing is uh, the extra renewables allow you to shift more into coal, and uh, that is really coming out of uh, you know sort of reducing the need to build new natural gas combined cycle units in the southeast. You know, sort of the two main things that go on there if our renewables are more available in the model. So uh, I want to then quickly do the same sort of thing for energy efficiency. Um, so what happens if we basically I've assumed that you know what if we have twice as much energy efficiency as were used in uh, uh, EPA's analysis, uh, keeping the cost the same, but assuming that there's you know just twice as much available. Where does that? So these are again sort of the original results for the main case. And then what happens if you've got extra energy efficiency factoring into those emissions rate goals? Um, so basically what you can see here is those, you know, putting that extra energy efficiency into the model, you know, makes it easier for the existing COE units to keep running, uh, sort of the main effect. And then, you know, you really don't need the new natural gas units in the model because that energy efficiency is, you know, reducing your demand enough that you are, Sort of no longer needing that new generation to come into the model, so you're sort of meeting your needs by you know sort of shifting around amongst existing units, um, but but that also removes the need to build a new renewable generation in the southeast. So uh, moving on to what happens in sort of an emissions rate approach versus uh, if each state were converting things to mass. Sorry, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, before you jump on that, Martin, could you uh, remind us how you got the mass-based targets that you used in the model? Uh, the mass-based targets were, uh, I took those from EPA's calculations uh, from their November, uh, uh, you know, notice of day of notice or whatever, rate to mass, uh, you know, conversion calculation. So these, these are the mass numbers from uh, EPA's analysis. So they... Uh, my, you know, the EPA just sort of described back in the June release, you know, one way of doing it, which was to uh, run the emissions rate targets for a particular state or region, you know, see what mass that gave you and then apply that as a mass cap. Um, but what I've done here is to actually take those EPA calculations of mass targets and apply those to the, the nine states in our southeast region and similarly for the other regions in the country. So rate versus mass, what happens to the different types of generation? So these again are the rate numbers from before. 
Um, so a mass a mass approach, as I said, you know the mass approach, is, you know can tend to add some flexibility depending on uh, you know exactly what's going on. Um, so that flexibility reduces costs, and uh, those reduced costs do tend to make it uh, cheaper to run the existing coal units. So you do see an actual increase in generation of the coal units under a mass approach. Um, and that generation is tending to come out of the existing uh, natural gas combined cycle units. So a mass approach, you know, a rate approach is potentially somewhat inflexible because, um, you know, if you just sort of like proportionally scaled down your existing coal units and your existing gas units, that does not help you get to an emissions rate target because you end up with the same emissions rate across those two types of units if you're sort of scaling them, them down in proportion. Whereas if you convert to a mass approach, um, you do have some additional flexibility where, you know, if you're reducing generation in total, that helps you meet those mass targets in ways that an, a rate approach does not necessarily do. Um, so you do see, you know, that, like I said, that increase in coal generation, and uh, then you are not really needing uh, the existing gas units, um, but you are sort of moving into uh, new gas units. So this, uh, you know, this uh, mass approach is, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of not applying, you know, the a rate approach tends to sort of subsidize in some sense the gas, existing gas units at the expense of the coal units. Um, you don't, under a mass approach, you don't get that sort of subsidy from gas into coal. So you get things moving in the opposite direction, and you also have an incentive to move into uh, uh, new, building more new gas uh, units. Uh, the mass approach also sort of re removes uh, any potential incentive for uh, renewables, unless you're sort of explicitly, you know, sort of taking that, any revenues generated from a mass approach and using them to uh, more explicitly subsidize renewables. So, um, just wanted to take a quick look, you know, more broadly, you know, what, what are these uh, different approaches across the U.S. doing to uh, national emissions and how does that compare with potentially the 2005 uh, baseline that people like to talk about. So, you can see here I've got the, the baseline emissions uh, for the electricity sector in uh, the black dashed line. And that can be compared with, uh, you know, the rate approach in blue versus the, the mass approach in red. Uh, you can see where, you know, rate and mass give you, you know, roughly equivalent um, uh, declines in emissions of around 33 percent by 2030. Um, but then they do have somewhat different impacts going forward in time. The rate approach, uh, um, you can still, you can still grow your emissions under a rate approach as long as you keep your, you know, rate in terms of pounds per megawatt hour at the right level. There's more room for uh, emissions to grow under the rate approach versus the, uh, the, the mass cap of the existing units where the, any growth in, uh, renew, any growth in emissions under that mass cap are coming from, you know, your additions of uh, new natural gas units that aren't under, you know, this, you know, policy covering the existing units. And we'll come back potentially to the end where if you roll those new gas units into the policy, you know, how, how differently does that, you know, cause some of these pictures to look? Um, but we'll have to see how the time works out on that. So jumping into the cost results, uh, some things to keep in mind, as I said, you know, any sort of flexibility is always going to lower the mitigation costs. As you know, people are have more room to sort of seek out the cost-effective responses to the policy, and in the the modeling construct, you know, construction decisions are going to be sort of optimal as uh, people use their foresight to plan for these, uh, you know, policy, you know, costs that they see coming up, and take advantage of this flexibility, um, you know, across regions and over time, all that sort of thing, and that will affect uh, the pattern of investments that you see in the model. And uh, also keep in mind when interpreting the allowance prices for the CO2 emissions that they're a bit different under a, a rate approach versus a mass approach. Under the rate approach, uh, the fossil units will be paying 
um, the, the allowance price if their emissions rate is, uh, you know, over the goal rate and they will be uh, receiving that price if their unit's emissions rate is under the emissions goal rate. Whereas under the mass approach, uh, all the affected fossil units will be paying in proportion to, to their emissions, regardless of, uh, you know, any sort of goal rate in the model. Uh, also, just keep in mind that, you know, when we're reporting the costs for the mass-based policies, we're not really including uh, the value of any CO2 allowances because they are, you know, sort of a transfer from one agent or one person to another in the model and uh, not really necessarily a cost in terms of additional generation costs or more of a transfer and how you sort of handle that transfer would then depend on who is experiencing those uh, payments. And also I'm going to go into this a bit, but uh, keep in mind that uh, energy efficiency is potentially being allowed in the baseline, which is uh, different than some, you know, the, the EPA approach. So that well, allowing the energy efficiency, if it's cost effective into the baseline, would remove its uh, cost savings uh, then from the policy results when you do sort of the comparison between, you know, what is your baseline versus the policy costs. And that approach is also true of how we've handled the coal efficiency retrofits, but that doesn't have much of an effect on the results. So just to be clear uh, what I'm doing with those energy efficiency uh, measures, uh, you can think of it really in terms of there's two different baselines, you know, two different alternatives that the policy can can be compared to. So you've got uh, a baseline with the energy efficiency potentially already rolled in if it's cost effective, and then a baseline where the energy efficiency is not allowed to enter, which would be uh, similar to the, uh, the EPA analysis. And just more broadly, keep in mind that these energy efficiency numbers are lowering electricity demand by somewhere in the, you know, up to 11% by 2030. So uh, how does this approach to uh, the energy efficiency, uh, you know, accounting affect the estimated policy costs? Um, just yeah, as a sort of rough numerical example, if uh, the baseline uh, resource costs, sort of system costs for generating electricity without energy efficiency would have been $52 billion in 2025 and uh, you know, the energy energy efficiency might save $2 billion, then if you, uh, so, you know, you could have sort of two baselines. A baseline without energy efficiency is $52 billion, and the baseline, if you roll in those savings, assuming they are savings from the efficiency measures, uh, would have a cost of uh, $50 billion. So then if you are reporting the policy costs for the clean power plan, um, say those resource costs, you know, regardless of what you think of as your baseline, your policy costs are $53 billion for the clean power plan. Uh, the change in costs from the policy would then be $1 billion if you were measuring them against the, in some sense, original baseline that excluded those energy efficiency measures. So that'd be $53 billion versus $52 billion. So that would be a, a policy cost of $1 billion versus, um, you know, sort of the alternative, uh, you still have the policy costs are $53 billion, but if, you, if you've already factored some energy efficiency savings into the baseline, then the policy cost would be that $53 billion minus the $50 billion, so a policy cost of $3 billion. And taking a look at what that means for sort of the, the regional approach, trading approach versus the state trading approach, approach what I've got here is, uh, you know, sort of looking at the annual percentage changes in uh, uh, costs for the southeast under uh, the emissions rate trading scheme. So, in looking on the left-hand side of the graph at the regional trading and the right-hand side of the graph at, uh, you know, state trading, which would be the state's go to loan, and then looking at that, you know, what are those costs, you know, compared with the baseline without energy efficiency versus with energy efficiency. So if you are measuring the policy costs in a regional trading approach without energy efficiency, what you've got is uh, 
So sort of a roughly 4% increase in uh, system costs in 2020 th for the regional approach and uh, an actual uh, cost decline in 2030 um, for the region if, uh, if you're, you know, once you sort of achieve those energy efficiency savings uh, in the model. And you would, you know, and then you'd have a similar thing for the state's uh, trading approach, uh, but, you know, state, states going alone have higher, higher costs than uh, the regional approach, so those bars are a bit higher, you know, sort of 6% cost in 2020 versus 4% uh, for the uh, regional approach. And you can compare those to, uh, if you were looking at uh, costs with uh, sort of where you've already factored in those energy efficiency savings under the regional approach, uh, you'd see that, uh, you know, what you would sort of report as your policy costs would be more like, you know, 5% in 2020 versus uh, 4%. And then uh, that, you know, sort of policy cost savings that you saw in 2030 would be, you know, somewhat reversed and there would be a, you know, a, you know, two-ish, two, three percent policy costs in 2030 if you're uh, sort of not reporting those policy energy efficiency cost savings. And a similar story, but uh, higher generally policy costs for the uh, state's go to loan. So these are some, you know, annual numbers for 2020 and uh, then 2030. Uh, if you take a look at those uh, costs in terms of uh, a present value measure that sort of rolls in the first, uh, you know, decade of the policy, all the costs through 2030, and look at, uh, you know, rate versus mass and uh, regional versus state, what are those uh, costs, assuming we've already factored in the energy efficiency savings potentially. So again, you've got a, you know, a rate-based uh, regional trading scheme uh, costing around 2% in present value terms versus uh, closer to uh, 3% uh, for the uh, state's go to loan under the rate approach. And then, uh, you know, the, the lower costs for the mass approach that has potentially some more flexibility. So uh, sort of less than a percent and a half for a mass approach with uh, the, uh, uh, the regional trading scheme and then somewhat higher for the mass approach under the uh, state uh, state rates. So I am uh, coming close to the end of my scheduled time, so let me go into, oh, nope, never mind. A few more graphs. Uh, let me, I did quickly, I uh, don't want to go too far down, you know, some of these, you know, state level cost results. I'm still sort of poking into you know, really getting a good handle on what are the drivers at the state level of some of these policy costs, but I did want to quickly take a look at uh, the allowance prices in the, the southeast, uh, you know, which are sort of, you know, the marginal costs for meeting the policy, sort of, you know, the most, what is the most costly measure in each state or region that is being taken to meet uh, these policy goals. So starting with uh, the regional rate trading approach. Um, so these are your costs in terms of uh, dollars per ton for the southeast as a whole showing now. So you're talking, you know, sort of 25 to 30 dollars per ton for the southeast. And again, sort of keep in mind that that's dollars per ton above and below that emissions rate goal. That's not applied to every, every single ton in the model. That's just sort of tons over each unit's uh, emissions uh, or each state's emissions rate goal. And you can contrast those results for the regional trading from uh, what happens uh, to each state if it were to uh, go it alone. Um, so you can see, you know, we've got sort of a group of states here that are, you know, in some cases uh, sort of, you know, you know lower cost uh, options uh, if, uh, if they go it alone in terms of pounds per megawatt hour. Um, and then we come to a couple of uh, states that are, you know, significantly higher costs in terms of what, uh, you know, what, what are the actions that they have to take in order to meet their emissions rate goals. And, uh, you know, so they, they kind of jump out at you a bit, um, but they're, what the model is saying is those states are, don't have many flexible options to meet their individual emissions rate goals if they don't engage in some regional trading versus the states that are potentially below the regional, you know, average cost that would uh, then benefit from trading with these high state costs. So, you know, under the trading approach, everyone is potentially a winner. Um, 
uh, but you know, you know, it depends on sort of where you're at to, you know, exactly what those allowance prices are. And then coming to the, the rest of the group of states, you can see where, you know, again, we've got some states that are essentially lower cost in terms of like North and South Carolina in particular are uh, below the, uh, the regional average and could thus sort of benefit from trading with those higher cost states. And then, uh, you know, Tennessee is sort of on the higher end and Virginia is sort of uh, splitting the difference in terms of uh, where they're at uh, on uh, these costs. Uh, then quickly moving on to, you know, what happens under uh, a mass-based approach versus those regional costs. Um, so these were the uh, uh, allowance prices under the rate approach from that previous graph, although I've rescaled the graph to sort of focus more on these mass prices that are lower. Um, so these are the allowance prices under a mass approach, so it's more in the uh, 12 to $15 a ton range, um, but those are being applied to every ton emitted from the affected units. And uh, you can see uh, those compare those regional results um, from the regional southeast mass approach, mass cap, then would be compared to each of these sort of individual state, you know, go it alone, uh, you know, allowance prices under a mass approach and see, you know, states are grouped a bit closer together because of the additional flexibility provided by the mass approach. Um, but there are still uh, sort of, you know, the benefits from trading uh, regionally, even if uh, you are a bit closer uh, in terms of these mass uh, allowance prices. So final thoughts um, before we go into questions and uh, any potential sensitivity discussion. Uh, just keep in mind that, you know, the coil units under a match approach, one of the big results is they are having, you know, more time to adjust, but the existing gas units are being affected more quickly. Uh, you know, when you're looking sort of a longer term, uh, where are we at, uh, you know, either a mass approach or a rate approach is leaving you somewhere around 33% uh, below the emissions uh, in 2005, so, uh, and then how you sort of account for and model this energy efficiency is potentially very important in terms of both what you're reporting for your policy costs and uh, how, you know, how easy or hard is it is to meet these various goals. And then finally, uh, you know, back to the sort of the original ranking, uh, you do have this general ranking of, uh, you know, a regional sort of broad mass-based approach is the most cost-effective approach, followed by, you know, mass trading amongst uh, each of the states individually, and then, uh, you know, you know, moving into the, the regional, you know, rate trading, and uh, finally the state rate trading. And we haven't really had a chance to discuss it, but, uh, you know, keep in mind that potentially there is a lot of uh, value tied up in the allowances under a mass-based approach, and uh, somebody has to decide, you know, who gets that. So, thank you, and I guess we can uh, move to, I, well, I guess, first of all, questions, and then we'll see, see where we go from there. Yeah, thanks so much, Martin. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions. Uh, some, we have a number that have already come in, but uh, I've, I've gathered during Martin's presentation that people are not seeing a raise your hand button. So if you have a question that you would like to ask uh, Martin um, verbally, then please go ahead and use the chat function. You can chat me, I'll see it, and then I will unmike, I'll unmute you so that you can ask Martin your question. Um, or you can continue to use the chat function to just ask your question uh, directly if that's easier for you. So Martin, a couple uh, to, to start off. One, um, if you could just state again what you're referring to when you say costs, um, if you're talking about retail costs, electricity, or, or I don't think that what, what exactly you're talking about. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, yeah, when I say cost, yes, I'm sort of broadly, I'm referring to sort of, you know, system costs of generating and supplying electricity to the grid. Uh, the model, you know, sort of around that would then estimate um, some wholesale electricity price, uh, wholesale electricity prices, um, which, uh, well, let me quickly skip ahead to those. Um, just So this, this isn't quite what I was referring to as cost, but this is a different sort of cost metric. You could, 
you know, measure costs in terms of either wholesale or retail electricity prices, the model sort of directly measures, estimates these changes in wholesale electricity prices, and then you would have to uh, sort of factor in, you know, stranded assets and, you know, other things to, if you wanted to turn, you know, and, and sort of, you know, rules on, you know, how electricity prices are regulated if you want to determine what the model estimates as a wholesale electricity price into a regional price. But this graph does show what's going changing in the wholesale electricity prices. Um, for uh, the baseline in black, uh, sort of the rates in blue and the mass in red that we've been talking about. And then it's also including uh, some policies that we didn't really get to in terms of what happens if you roll the new gas combined cycle into either a rate-based approach or a mass-based approach? And uh, there's, there's sort of where you see potentially significantly different impacts on what the wholesale and, you know, thus potentially what's happening with the retail electricity prices if you roll in those new gas units. So if you roll the new gas units into a rate approach, um, you can actually see the elect wholesale electricity costs going down because um, what you are then doing, you know, under a rate approach, you are sort of in effect subsidizing those new gas units under under that policy then. And, you know, potentially those new gas units are what are sec setting the electricity price. So if you're subsidizing those, then their generation costs are going down. And that's what you're seeing there with the dashed blue line versus um, sort of the opposite effect happening under a mass approach, if you uh, roll the new units, gas units, into a mass approach, you are forcing them to purchase and hold allowances for their emissions. And if they are the ones setting the electricity, wholesale electricity price, you know, that is like an extra expense to them and that the wholesale prices then rise under that approach. So, but what I was talking about during the main presentation was, yeah, more the sort of system generation costs when I said that, uh, yeah, you know, like the, the regional mass approach is less costly than uh, a regional rate approach. That was sort of referring to the, the system generating costs. As a long-winded answer to that no, that's, question. That's, that makes sense. Um, we had a question about the sort of how to think about um, regional compliance approach versus a state-by-state -state compliance approach. Um, so imagine you have, the question here talks about, imagine you have a state, say like Kentucky, where you identified has a fairly high um, or on face value less stringent rate-based target around 1800. The question is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more clear why other states may want to partner with Kentucky in a mm -hmm. sort of a regional or multi-state cooperation situation. But what incentives are there for Kentucky to, to partner with states? Um, the, the concern, I think, is that by doing so, it would raise pri uh, prices for Kentucky compared to whether it just uh, went at it alone? Um, well, I guess, yeah, first of all, in terms of the Kentucky example, I would probably say you know, potentially the opposite is that I'm, I'm, you know, I guess, you know, unlike what uh, the EPA model modeling was coming up with, I was estimating that uh, Kentucky is a fairly high cost state. So they are, they are, you know, sort of the ones with, with you know, significant incentive to, uh, partner with other states, even though they have a high emissions goal. Um, you know, I, I should clarify that that is, in these particular results, that is a function of, you know, assuming that we are, you know, applying the policy just to the existing units and not rolling in the new units to those results. So the fact that they have a, a target of around 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour, you know, they're, they're not in those results getting to count like a new natural gas unit against that 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour. So what they've got to do is either, you know, get their coal units down to 1,800 pounds or they've got to build some uh, renewables and uh, take advantage of the energy efficiency in order to meet that goal. And uh, the modeling is suggesting that that's potentially hard to do because they don't have a whole lot of renewable options available, uh, at least at uh, sort of the main set of uh, modeling result prices. Uh, but so they they would certainly yeah, have an incentive to trade with other states um, as a high cost states and uh, sort of, you know, alternatively, you know, the states that are low cost would be able to, uh, you know, 
you know, make money by taking advantage of their low-cost options to achieve emissions reductions and, you know, selling those low-cost options potentially to Kentucky and, you know, bringing that money back home. So Kentucky would win from avoiding having to build, you know, like ineffective wind as an example. And, uh, you know, uh, South Carolina might benefit from building a more cost-effective solar or something along those lines. So the idea isn't um, maybe particular to Kentucky necessarily, but right. the general principle about the, why a low-cost state, a low-cost compliant state may want to work with a high-cost compliant state because then it could um, sell those low-cost compliant opportunities across state lines. Yeah. And a high-cost compliant state would take advantage of low-cost compliant across state lines. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I was just picking on two particular examples of sort of the opposite ends, but yeah. Sure. Uh, we had another question about um, energy efficiency. So the, the, the questioner asked if you could explain again um, and correct if this isn't true, but why energy efficiency in the policy case sort of raises costs. Um, maybe this is getting to your discussion uh, about whether it's in the baseline or not, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't say it. It doesn't raise costs per se. It's, 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 I mean, what we're measuring with these policy costs are sort of, you know, it's a, the cost of the clean power plan relative to something. Um, so the cost of the clean power plan is always, always whatever it is. Um, but it's what it's measured against that, you know, I'm sort of potentially saying there's two alternatives. Um, so if you've got a baseline where you haven't got the energy efficiency measures in the baseline, you know, that's a fairly costly baseline. So when you measure that cost incremental, you're looking at, you know, a fairly, um, you know, well, sorry, I, you're able to, you know, when you apply the policy, you know, if you, if you haven't already rolled in those energy efficiency measures, you can take advantage of that, you know, cost incremental. Um, if you've already sort of let those energy efficiency measures into the baseline, you sort of factor them into your thinking. Um, you know, you're, you know, you're not, you don't have those cost savings then, you know, appearing as part of the policy cost savings, you know, from those energy efficiency measures. I know it's a, it's a bit confusing, but, uh, um, you know, you're, you're really not changing what's going on with the policy. You're really just sort of ch changing what you're measuring the policy against, whether or not you've rolled in any cost savings from energy efficiency into the baseline. So that's sort of the difference between those blue and red bars that are on the screen at the moment. Okay. Uh, another question, just seeking clarification um, to make sure you folks heard it correctly, that you did not adjust individual state rate or mass targets when you did the regional approach. So there's no that, aggregation of individual state targets into a regional target. That is true, yes. I have not, yeah, if you averaged all the uh, rates in the southeast together, yeah, I mean, you end up somewhere from what I've seen, you know, around 800 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, but yeah, we have not done that. So under, you know, sort of a, a generation weighted uh, trading approach under the regional trading scheme. So. Kentucky keeps its 1,800 pound uh, emissions rate goal, and uh, then there would be sort of incentive to uh, generate more, you know, like existing gas. Well, actually, Kentucky doesn't have the existing gas particularly, but uh, um, there's uh, yeah incentive to uh, shift uh, generation patterns around to uh, sort of take advantage of the fact that each state has an, a different emissions rate target that's sort of maintained at those initial levels. Um, and, and the reason I did that is, I guess, largely because the, the wording is a bit ambiguous in the rule on exactly what's going to be allowed, and I was having a hard time convincing myself that, uh, you know, states would be willing to enter into a regional trading compact if they had to take a significant reduction in their emissions rate target. So what we wanted to do was take a look at, you know, assume everyone is still keeping their own target, are there still benefits from regional trading? And, and we're sort of showing that there were for sure. Another question about emissions, I think you had a slide up that showed kind of emission consequences for various compliance pathways. 
Um, just wanted to clarify whether those emissions are for um, total power sector emissions or just for emissions from affected units, from existing source emissions. That was a total electricity sector, um, all, all units affected plus any new gas units or whatever that's entering into the mix. Um, it, is, it does not include emissions from like uh, combined heat and power or whatever selling into the grid, but does include existing plus new sources within, you know, the electricity industry and independent power producers. A um, couple more economics-related questions. So you talked a little bit about wealth transfers. Um, if you could maybe hit on that again in terms of how wealth flows in a rate-based uh, compliance approach versus a math-based compliance approach. Um, and maybe how that relates to electricity prices. Mm. Well, how, yeah, I, I, I probably should set aside how that relates to electricity prices because okay. that, how, how, uh, how any sort of buying and selling of uh, allowances across uh, state boundaries would affect electricity prices really depends on, you know, the individual rules about, you know, how, how any sort of benefits or costs from that trading are, you know, determined to flow through, you know, in terms of the, you know, state regulations, how those, Things have to flow through into the retail uh, electricity prices, um, but yeah. So uh, under like the the mass the mass approach, um, yeah. So states each state is uh, getting its uh, mass target as as presented in those EPA calculations, and then can buy or sell allowances under the regional approach with with anyone else, you know, within the region, and then that money. You know, would flow to flow to that region, um, but then you know, once it got into that region, then it would be sort of up to that state's rules or how that state was approaching those revenues, where where that sort of value ended up in terms of uh, did it flow through to the the ratepayer somehow, was it used to subsidize you know some other particular type of generation? So so those those interstate transfers are taking place. Um, but you know how they sort of flow through into the final, you know, electricity prices would would depend on the, the regulations again. You mentioned earlier in the, pro the presentation that DM has a macro component. Um, does are you planning to, or have you already evaluated potential job impacts of different compliance methods? Um, we have not we have not linked uh, them up for this analysis, uh, much less yeah worrying about you know is that the right sort of mechanism to you know make claims about uh, job impacts. Um, it's it's a bit tricky. I mean, what the the sort of macroeconomic side of the model is set up to do is to estimate energy efficiency measures in response to you know changes in electricity prices. And then it's uh, it's a bit tricky to say you know given these assumptions of you know these are sort of predetermined assumptions you know using the EPA data of you know what are energy efficiency measures that are going to come in in response to the policy and it's it's a little tricky to decide how you want to interact those two um, we will probably look at uh, linking them up and seeing what happens and uh, you know deciding exactly what we have to do about that. Uh, um, normally, what we use the macroeconomic things for are, you know, it would estimate like a change in electricity demand if the electricity price went up or down, and it would uh, affect, you know, estimate uh, sort of changes in GDP and, you know, you know, broader economic measures like that, and and would also estimate any differences in terms of like residential electricity demand versus commercial or industrial electricity demand if uh, prices were varying. But we'll have to, yeah, sort of see where we get with that over the summer and, yeah, yeah. I suppose how the final rule ends up looking like and whatnot and uh, revisit all of this stuff. So I have just a couple more questions um, in the queue. If, again, if you do have questions for Martin, uh, please use the chat function to uh, type them or you can ask me to unmute you if you would like to ask uh, the question yourself. So. We have another one about um, the interim goal. So there's been a lot of discussion and comments and, and subsequently from the EPA about the treatment of the interim goal. Um, I think the ideas in the air may be relaxing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you, 
So you, for with, but you, in the modeling, the interim goal uh, kicks in in 2020, if I recall correctly. Are there plans to um, do further modeling with different in, interim goal assumptions? Um, yeah, well, I'd say, yeah, the, the interim goal applies, you know, over the entire decade, 2020 to 2029. So you're allowed to adjust within the decade already in the modeling around that interim goal. Uh, as you saw in the results, though, I mean, it is showing that, you know, you do have a, 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 a quick reduction in coal generation regardless of, you know, any smoothing you can do over that decade. So, yeah, if you relax that interim goal or you, you know, had the policy start in 2025, it would obviously, you know, be, be a looser policy and you would not see some of those initial shifts in electricity generation. Uh, I'm sure we will analyze that, especially if it is, you know, ends up being part of the final rule. Um, at the moment, we would be sort of taking a, a very wild guess at what, you know, the best, you know, interim goal to sort of pick to, to analyze. So I don't know, you know, we, we could probably take a quick look at it. Um, it'll be easier, assuming that is part of the discussion in the final goal to uh, decide what's the appropriate interim target to use and what, what the timing of it is. Okay, a couple more coming in. Um, so we had a question about co-pollutant uh, impacts of uh, heat rate improvements and redispatching. Does the, the does our modeling look at that at all? Say in terms of NOx, SOx, other other pollutants. Uh, yeah, the, the the model is estimating the the criteria pollutants uh, for sure, um, both in in the baseline in response to the baseline policies, maps, and everything else, and then uh, how that would change under the clean power plan. I guess I yeah I obviously haven't presented that here that that is part of the results um, we have not attempted to you know sort of take those results and turn them into some estimated uh, you know benefit using you know air quality modeling and value of life type of stuff that you would see in uh, uh, you know EPA's uh, you know I think chapter four in the, the RIA um, I guess we don't have a well, we're we, we're sort of looking at you know doing some of that benefits work in house, um, but we haven't gotten there yet. But you know, potentially something we'll be doing in house. Um, alternatively, could just take a look at reporting what those emissions are, and then uh, people could make their own calculations on sort of additional benefits from those reductions in criteria pollutants because of the policy. So yeah, when I say costs, we're yeah just really focusing on the sort of generation cost side and not. Uh, looking at the, the benefit side of the, the equation and the modeling, but that is certainly important to keep in mind. How did you treat um, you know, reti future retirements of, of coal plants, maybe announced retirements or p retirements for, for other reasons? Uh, we have put uh, the announced retirements uh, from uh, the EIA data and also some information that uh, was pulled together by some other sources into the model, and then the model could also choose to uh, do any additional retirements uh, in response to uh, particularly the mercury air toxics. Um, so that both of those things are going on in the model in, in the baseline, and then that would, you know, then, you know, those units would uh, sort of not be around uh, in the policy case either. Uh, we had a question about how we plan to roll out these results to utilities and states in the southeast. Um, I, you know, th this, I guess I'll note that this webinar is an option, a, a vehicle for us doing that. Um, we also are in continuous sort of conversations with those, uh, you know, parties uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, Martin, I don't know if you wanted to mention any next steps in terms of um, written analysis. Yeah, uh, we're going to be writing up uh, sort of both both what's going on nationally and you know broadly in maybe some uh, different regions of the country um, for the main you know, sort of main scenarios and uh, looking at you know sort of U.S. level results that can be compared with uh, other analyses and looking at what some of these sensitivities do in other parts of the country, uh, but and then also doing a sort of a separate piece focusing in a bit more detail on the southeast and. Uh, Looking at, at what is going on there, and uh, you know, trying to estimate, you know, some state level uh, costs and uh, you know, trading impacts, benefits, all that sort of stuff at the at the state level.
and you know writing those up you know within yeah the the near the very near future and getting getting those out the door so here's a a question um i think this goes to one of the main one of the takeaways of the of your of the, your modeling which is um you know the mass based trading versus regional um leads to greater uh reduction in compliance costs but if you could sort of talk through the logic of why um, the mass based regional approach leads to um, allows more coal generation and leads to more new natural gas generation than its rate based counterpart mm -hmm. um, well i mean yeah there's there's certainly a wide uh, variety of things that go into that uh, let me see if I can semi quickly get back to uh, that graph cast it um, so like I said I mean in part it's a, a story about the you know the flexibility provided by a mass approach where um, you know under a rate approach like I said if you sort of scale you know if you have one coal unit and one gas unit and you scale them scale generation for both of those units back in proportion you've done nothing to achieve a, uh, an emissions rate reduction because you know you're you're in the same spot you were before you scaled them both back versus uh if you scale them both back you know you've gone you know some way towards meeting a math target so i i think of that as being you know somewhat a more flexible approach um and so that you know that more flexible approach you know you know, opens the door. You know, makes makes the policy in general you know cheaper, and uh, that cheaper cost uh, allows uh, the the coal units to generate a bit more. So you've got, I mean, under either the rate approach or the mass approach, you've got you know a fair number of retirements going on. Obviously, if you sort of compare those policies to the original baseline generation without the policy, um, but. Um, so the the retirements are fairly similar, as I recall, between the two. But what you've got is uh, the coal units are running at a bit higher utilization rate under the mass approach, um, and then it's it, the model is sort of saying that it is, uh, you know, it's more cost effective to keep running those coal units and cut back on some of these older existing uh, gas combined cycle units in order to meet your mass target, and then. Uh, you, know, you still have to make up that generation somewhere so again that gets you back into a situation where you've got you know these existing coal and gas units that are under the being affected by this policy versus the new gas units that are outside of the policy under this particular way of running them the model and uh, so that still gives you that incentive to shift from the existing units into new units as, as a, a broad characterization of what's going on there uh, any last thoughts, Martin, um, before we wrap it up? Uh, no, thanks, everyone. Uh, like I said, yeah, well, we're certainly uh, looking forward to uh, getting some more information out the door and uh, you know, papers approach and whatnot will give us a chance to go into some more details that we haven't you know, been able to get to in an hour or so here. But thank you all for joining, and uh, yeah, let us, uh, let us know what you think and you know, questions and whatnot going forward, I guess. Yeah. I also want to mention that we plan to continue um, – the, the modeling effort. So this is what we've described as phase one. We're um, going to continue uh, phase two and, and continue modeling um, after the final rule is out. So be on the be on the lookout and for, and we'll be in touch with you about um, additional uh, write-ups of our modeling results and webinars. In addition, uh, many of you may have seen that we released a policy brief today on a common elements approach to um, state clean power plan compliance pathways, um, which uh, I hope you'll take a look at. And want to remind you again of our, our webpage that we have dedicated to our Clean Air Act and Clean Power Plan work. You can go to nicholasinstitute.org, sorry, nicholasinstitute.edu, nicholasinstitute.duke.edu, sorry. <laughs> nicholasinstitute.duke.edu, click on Climate and Energy Program, and then Special Projects, and you'll, you'll see a button there on our uh, Clean Air Act work. Thank you all so much for uh, joining the webinar, especially Martin for presenting and taking so much extra time to answer questions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.